concise but very impacting. May your word find room in our hearts. We thank you and bless you. Every other voice, we shut it out in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that we want to hear from you. So speak to us. Lord, as the vessel that you have chosen to use today, I stand on feet of clay. I need your grace. I need your divine enablement. I need your divine ability, clarity. Take hold of my faculties. And Jesus, speak through me. I give you praise and I give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody say, give the Lord a mighty hand clap. Hallelujah. Awesome, awesome. Well, the Lord is a good God. Isn't the Lord good? Come on, give somebody compliments. Look at somebody and say, you are looking so good this morning. Tell, tell somebody something good. <laughs> tell your sister, tell your brother, say, I can see the Lord has done you well. <laughs> Some compliments, please. At least, oh, I like your hair, or I like your, you know, something. <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. So at this point in time, I want to ask our brother Marcus, are you there? Marcus and Eloise, you're going to be having your wedding on March the 25th. Are you, are you guys around? Marcus? Where's Marcus? Oops. He's preparing. Eloise, are you around? Oh. He's preparing, he's coming, okay? He's one of our deacons. But on the 25th of March, this man, something is going to happen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn to the word of the living God, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. The subject of my discussion is entitled, Jesus is Precious. Jesus is Precious. We are in the throes of entering, stepping into the supernatural but let me tell you something. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Everything that we do, it is by the grace of God. It is by the love of God. It is a delegated authority and power that has been invested in us by the grace of God. So I want us today to focus on who this Jesus is again. First Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You know, my pastor told me one time, he said, the moment you see therefore, go back and find out why the therefore is therefore. So let's go back to verse 6. Again, it begins with therefore. <laughs> it is also contained in the scripture, but this is why the therefore in verse 7 is. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Can you repeat that? Chief cornerstone. Elect, precious, and he who believes on him, he will by no means be put to shame. Father, I pray that we'll get understanding of this powerful word why Jesus is precious. You know, I have come up with some photographs yet for you to see what a, a cornerstone is, a capstone, okay? A capstone, a keystone. You can see them in buildings. In fact, without that keystone, without that capstone there, that bridge will not hold. It will not hold. You can even see, again, another photograph there that holds it, okay? The next one there, okay? You see a keystone there and a capstone on, on top. If you tamper with that middle one, that thing will come tumbling down. If you tamper with Jesus, <laughs> he's the one that holds everything together. You know, here I have my necktie. The first button must be in the right hole. If I put it in the wrong hole, even if I try to dress smartly, it will never ever look smart. Put Jesus where he belongs. He's our number one. Hallelujah. He is the center of everything that we do. Without him, nothing is, is, is possible. So I want you to see that. That's why we say he is precious. Now, what does it mean, precious? Something that is adorable, something that is dearest, something that is est inestimable. It is of intrinsic worth. It is indispensable. We cannot do away with. We can't trade him for anything else. That's why he says, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world but lose his soul? 
So this morning, very fast, only three or four minutes per point, but I want to give you seven snippets as to why Jesus is precious. Are you ready? Tighten your belts. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. The first one, he is precious because of his prophecy. Because of his prophecy. In 2 Timothy, Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. This is the overall prophecy that Jesus has given unto us. We are running everywhere to hear words of prophecies from, from prophets. But every revelation that God has for you is contained in this book. Can I have a witness in the house? And anybody who says anything that contradicts this that has been predicted here, he's a false prophet. Again, I want to whet your appetite to love your Bible. To go back to the Bible and read the Bible. The Bible is nothing but a, word of a book of prediction, a book of prophecy. Somebody came up with an acronym. It is the basic instructions before leaving earth. And some of us don't read it. And yet we want to know the will of God. We want to know what plans God has in, in store for us. It is all here. It is all here. You know, we demonstrate, oh, they have burned Bibles from public places. They have burned Bibles from schools. But we have them collecting dust in our shelves. That's a contradiction. This morning, if you want to fall in love with Jesus, go back to his prophecy. Go back and find out what he has in store for you. He says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, Behold, I'm coming back quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Of this book. I want you to fall in love with this book. This book is still the bestseller. It is still the most read in the world. You see, in the Old Testament alone, there are 2,000 prophecies all about Jesus. Who he is, when he was to come, when he is to come again, where he was to be born, and where he would be ministering, it is all there. And why he was supposed to come. His mission, his purpose was all there. And how he was to come, how he was going to be born, how he was going to die, how he was going to go back. Again, how he's coming back. Hallelujah. It is all captured in this book. It is all in this book. Jesus is so precious because of his prophecy. You see, the Bible is called Holy. Holy means unique. It means one of a kind. It means peculiar. That's why we call, we call, we call the, the church the Holy Church, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Matrimony, Holy Communion. It is unique. It is one of a kind. There's nothing in this world like that. The Bible is so unique. The Bible is a, word of prophecy, is a book of prophecy because of its inspiration. It is inspired. It is not a concoction of the white man or the Jews. No. It is because of its infallibility. What do I mean? It is steadfast. It is solid. It is sound. It is sure. It is dependable. You can depend on this book. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never return to me void. And also because of its inerrancy. It has no error in it. And yet it is written by different prophets, different people, over 1,500 years. Some were in the desert, some were in the palace, some were somewhere, in, some in the dungeon, but they don't contradict. Can we give the Lord a mighty hand clap for this book? This book is awesome. And also it is indestructible. People have tried to destroy this, but no, it can never be destroyed. Hallelujah. It can never be destroyed. Jesus is precious. Because of his prophecy. You see the Bible, one, it claims to be the word of God. Thus says the Lord. And then when you read it, it seems to be the word of the Lord because it says, I love you. Thou shalt not kill. It is only God who loves people who can say that. But it also proves to be the word of God. How? When you mix it with faith. Hallelujah. The same word was preached to them, but it did not profit them anything because they did not mix it with faith. If you act on the word of God, you'll know that you can actually be born again. Hallelujah. 
You know it. You know that it works. Now, secondly, Jesus is precious because of who he is. His person, John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Wow, this was Philip asking. Look at 14 verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. Hallelujah. You know, he says, I and my Father, we are one. Jesus is the God man. He's a member of the Godhead. He's not just a prophet or a teacher. He's a member of the Trinity, the triune God. He is divine. He is God the Son. He is God in the flesh. He is 100% God. He is 100% man. What a unique personality. Give him a mighty hand clap in the house. There is no one in the universe like this man Jesus. There is no one like him. Jesus is so precious. Why? Because if you look at the 66 books of the Bible, every centerpiece of each book portrays Jesus as something. For example, Genesis is the seed of a woman. Exodus is the Passover lamb. Leviticus is our high priest. Numbers is the cloud by day, pillar by fire of night. Deuteronomy is the prophet like unto Moses. Joshua is the captain of our salvation. Judges, our judge and lawgiver. Ruth, our kinsman redeemer. Samuel, our trusted prophet. Kings, the Lord, our king. Chronicles, the reigning king. Ezra, our faithful spouse. Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the broken walls. Esther, our Mordecai. Job, our redeemer. Psalms, the Lord, our shepherd, and we shall not want. <laughs> Ecclesiastes, he's the lover, lover of our souls. Song of songs. He is our beloved fair one. Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. Jeremiah, he is the weeping prophet. Ezekiel, he is the wonderful four-faced man. Daniel, he is our first man who looks like the son of God in our burning furnace. Mama. Give him praise. Hosea, he is the faithful husband. Joel, he is the Holy Ghost baptizer. Amos, he is the burden bearer. Obadiah, he is the mighty, he is mighty to save. Jonah, he is the foreign missionary. Micah, he is the messenger with beautiful feet. Nahum, he is the avenger of God's elect. Habakkuk, he is, the, he is God's evangelist. Zephaniah, he is our savior. Haggai, he is the restorer of God's lost heritage. Zechariah, he is the open fountain or in David's house. Malachi, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Doesn't stop there, it comes to the New Testament. Matthew, he's the Messiah. He's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Mark, he's the wonder working king. Luke, he's the son of man. John, He's the word, the very son of the living God. Acts, he's the foundation of the church. Romans, he's our justifier. Galatians, Corinthians. Corinthians, he's our sanctifier. Galatians, he's our redeemer from the curse of the law. Ephesians, he's Christ, the unsearchable riches of God's wisdom. Philippians, he's the God that supplies all our needs. Colossians, he is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Thessalonians, he is our soon returning king. Timothy, he is the mediator between God and man. Titus, he is the faithful pastor. Philemon, he is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Hebrews, he is the blood of the everlasting covenant. James, he is our great physician. He's the doctor of all doctors. He's the consultant of all consultants. In John, he is love. Jude, the Lord is coming. Is the Lord coming down with back with his ten thousands of his saints? Revelation, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Give him praise in the house this morning. Thirdly, he is so precious. Why? He's a provider. His provision. Look at 2 Peter 1.3. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all, say all, 
of this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. What is the best provision that you can receive from Jesus? Salvation. Hallelujah. Salvation. He is the Savior. He has come to seek and to find. Wherever you run, Jesus is seeking you. He is, even if you go to the shrine, he's seeking you. Why? He has come to seek and save. To save. He's the Savior of the world. And when he saves you, some of us wonder, how on earth did they come to know Jesus? That is why he's precious. Hallelujah. That's why he's precious. And then when he saves you, he sustains you. Remember, every time I stand here before this holy, holy podium, I say, I stand on feet of clay. Any one of us, any minute we can fall, but the grace of God sustains us. Hallelujah. <laughs> he sustains us by his grace. Not by mind, not by power, but by his spirit. And you know what? Why do people dance here? He satisfies you to the fullness of your soul. You don't need any alcohol to get you excited. You need the Holy Ghost anointing. Hallelujah. <laughs> Very important. But also, he supplies. He's the supplier. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. You know, he meets our needs. How does he supply? He meets all our needs. His name is called Jehovah Jireh. The Lord my provider. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches through Christ Jesus. And David says, ever since I was young and now I am old, I've never seen the righteous forsaken all their children begging for bread. The Bible says, no good thing will he withhold from they that walk uprightly before him. God is the one that meets our needs. But also, he does not only meet our needs. You know what he does? He mends our brokenness. We have been singing about him here. He's a friend of the wounded hearts. He molds our character. We are in the university of character formation while we are still here. We are coming back to rule and reign with Christ. Hallelujah. We are coming back. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. Because his ways are not our ways. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. Next, his presence. We have been singing about his presence. Okay? All of us as Christians in this pilgrimage, in this journey that we are taking, you know what? We go what I call desert experience. Winter seasons of our lives. We go through dry spells. We go through the valley roads. Dark paths. We travel lonely journeys. If you lose your loved ones, life will never be the same again. So we go through emptiness sometimes. Sometimes I don't feel like coming to church. Can I be honest with you? I feel that my sleep is actually sweeter than coming to church. But when I come here and the presence of God is so intoxicating in a good way, <laughs> I can't help but begin to dance. Hallelujah. But we go through ups and downs. But that is not the end. Jesus is always there with us. And some of us are going through that right now. What you need is his presence. You need his presence. Because where the presence of God is, there's liberty. There's freedom. There's all kinds of things that can happen. My son gave me this thing. He said, I don't know where he got it from. He said, if the Lord is able to light up the stars in the sky, he is surely able to light up your path. Hallelujah. That's powerful. That's powerful. All of us do know the story of the sun, you know, the footprints in the sun. There was this person who came up with this poem that he had a dream. She or he had a dream, you know, people are contending whose it is, you know. We, she had a dream. And he said in the dream, he saw two footsteps. One was for him or her. The other one was for the Lord along the beach. And as she walked or he walked, what happened was he realized there are times when there's only one set of footsteps, not two sets. So, and then also, she or he realized it is the time when she or he was at his lowest or her lowest. Things were really bad. She was under the weather, in the valley, lonely road, alone. And she turned to the Lord in that dream and asked, say, Lord, how come when I needed you most? 
I don't see you. You disappear. I only see my footsteps. Why do you allow me to walk the rough desert road alone? Then the Lord said, no, 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 no. The footsteps that you see is not yours. They are mine. Those times is when I've carried you. When I've carried you, his presence, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So please, at a time when we're going through ups and downs, let's not look focus on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We change, but Jesus is immutable. He does not change. Be cognizant of that fact. Look at Psalms 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Look at Moses. Moses said, if your presence is not going with us, we will not go. For what will make us different from the other nations? You need the presence of God. You need the presence of God. Look about Abraham. There's a motif in the Bible that runs through the life of Abraham. Everywhere where Abraham went, Abraham pitched a tent, but he built an altar. If you read everywhere, he would pitch his tent. His name is called Abraham. But actually, Hebrew, the Hebrew. Hebrew comes from the original word that they call Habiru. Habiru means a sojourner, a wanderer, a pilgrim. We are pilgrims in this world. We pitch tents here, but we're going somewhere. But we must build the altar. What is the purpose of the altar? Prayer. The presence of God. You will need the presence of God wherever you go. Look at Joseph. In the pit, there's a motif, but God was with him. Read it. In Potiphar's house as a slave, but God was with him. In Pharaoh's palace, but God was with him. When he became the premier, in his premiership, but God was with him and God gave him favor. What was Joseph's secret? Like Abraham, Joseph had learned to build altars. You need to learn to build altars in every situation that you face. Whether you are in the pit, whether you are in the dungeon, whether you are in the palace, wherever you are, build an altar of prayer. Yeah. You need the presence of God. You need him. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the burning finance, they built an altar. Look at Daniel. Okay? When they said no more prayer. He went ahead and built a prayer tower on top of his house. Three times a day, he called on the name of the Lord publicly. You need the presence of God when you're being threatened. Hallelujah. He built a prayer altar in the lion's den. What about Esther? He built a prayer altar in the palace in Susa. And the Jews were spared of genocide of epic proportion. Look at Jonah. He built a prayer altar even in the belly of a fish. <laughs> Look at Paul and Silas in Philippi. When they were chained, their prayers could not be chained. They built a prayer altar even in jail. What are you going through? Build an altar of prayer. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is freedom. Then number five, you need his power. Because of his power. Jesus is precious because of his power. That power, the Greek word is dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. Dynamite, explosive. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority. Come on, say, all authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now that is power. Can you imagine? No wonder the Bible says, at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is indeed Lord to the glory of God the Father. All power, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Wow, he is precious. Hallelujah. He is precious. That's why he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. What is this power for? Power to, number one, to create. By the power of his spoken word, he spoke the universe and all the galaxies into existence. Now that is power. How is he going to defeat the Antichrist when he comes? By the power of his word again. Awesome. 
The same thing with us. We need to be careful with the power of our words. Pastor Sam has already preached about that. We can either bless or all the prophets. We are told to prophesy, to speak into the situation. Instead of rehearsing the bad things that the enemy is doing, agree with the word. Hallelujah. Say it is written. It is written. It is written. My God will never leave me. My God will never forsake me. Even if I'm going through the valley road of my life. Okay? Uh, but also, power to sustain. You see, the Lord holds the whole universe and the galaxies, the Milky Way is in place, and none of the stars and the planets spiral off as they hang on nothingness, including the earth that we live in. Can you imagine? Now, that is power to sustain. Power to sustain. That's why he says, not a single hair on your head can fall to the ground without him taking note. That's how powerful God is. Everything is counted. You are so special. You are so unique. You are so important. That again, I want to say, as I said it before, were it to be you and you alone on this planet Earth, Jesus would have still come and walked the dusty streets of Palestine and sought for you and you alone and died naked on the cross for you. That's how caring he is. But he has that power to sustain you. Whatever you're going through, don't give up. Hallelujah. Somebody said, if you're going through fire, don't stop. Go right through it. Hallelujah. And become a firebrand. <laughs> you know, but also power to tame, to tame creation. You know, we are all aware of how Jesus tamed the wind, the storm, the gravity, the buoyancy. You know, he defied Archimedes' principle of the law of displacement. You know, he walked on the water. We are all cognizant of that fact. You know, how he tamed nature by cursing the fig tree. He healed sickness. He raised the dead, disease, and death. I mean, he overcame all those. But one key thing that we always forget, on the day that he was going to die, we know he put the... The, the ear of Malchus back. But he rode on a donkey, a young calf that no one has ever ridden on. Now, some of you, who knows what a colt or a, a, a donkey is? When it is not trained, when it is unbroken, it can kick you. But because he can tame nature, hallelujah, he sat on it. I don't care whatever situation that you are going through. Whatever disease that has come upon your life that the doctors cannot even describe, I have the king of glory. Who can tame that disease? Who can tame that life-threatening challenge that you are going through? Focus on Jesus. He is precious. Can we give him a hand clap? Power. Power to procreate. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. Wow! This is powerful signs, wonders, miracles. A true story I read in church history. There was this Pope. He was called Pope Pius somebody. I forget the Pope number what. But he was called Pius. And then the Bank of Vatican had just been opened. And now because of the things that people used to buy, you know, to, to buy the souls of their loved ones out of purgatory and send them somewhere good, hell to purgatory, according to their theology. Don't believe it, okay? It is not true. And, and people are selling those, 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 those things. The church became so rich. So this pope found the governor. His name was called Latima. And he said, Latima, you see now, he was counting lots of money, silver and gold and all those counting, and lots of them. Then the pope said, Oh, Mr. Monsig now, we can no longer say silver and gold we don't have. See the money now what, that we have? But then also Latima said, Holy See, neither, unfortunately, neither can we say in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. That was sad. That was sad. And yet the creative power, the procreative power has been entrusted with the church. Hallelujah. We need never ever to lose that power. Look at Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and all those. Power to witness. The power is not just for hooey gooey feeling down our spines. 
the power to make us bold and go out and declare the word of God with authority. With authority. He says, you'll be my witnesses. Our purpose here is to plant the hell and populate heaven. That's why we are here, but we need the power. Power to demolish every stronghold, shatter every yoke, every argument, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ in our lives. We have the power, we have the capacity, hallelujah. That's why Jesus is so precious to us. Power to synergize with Christ. The Bible says one will take away 1,000, but two will put 10,000 to flight. Very important. You see, in Matthew 28, it says, Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. In other words, synergize with me like two ox oxen together. Okay? Yoke together. And they were doing the same job, pulling it together. Very important. I want to give you a, a brief illustration here. And this is a true uh, uh, experiment. There was one horse that could only pull 500 ki kgs, kilograms. Another one could also pull 500 kilograms. So we expected 1,000 when you put them together. But when they were put together, they pulled a staggering, instead of 1,000 together, they pulled 2,000, more than their weights, weights of each one of them. Where did they borrow the other energy from? Synergy. Synergy. That's why Jesus is so adamant and he's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's why he invites us to take upon his yoke. That's why he sent them two by two. That's why he wants unity in the body. Father, I pray that they may be one just like I and my father. We are one so that the world may know that you sent me. How can the two work together unless they are in agreement? Unity is strength. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, I love you with the love of Jesus. Quickly. His providence. His providence. What is providence? God working behind the scene for his will to bear relevance in his ultimate, wonderful, marvelous, phenomenal, glorious plan and purpose for you. He works in ways we cannot understand. Look at Saul as a young man. Lost the donkeys. The father said, go and look for the donkey. But God had a bigger plan. He was anointed. That's the king, the first king of Israel. Look at David. The father says, take this cheese to your brother and this loaf and take it to the battlefield. When he arrives there, who does he see? Goliath. And what happened? From who is he, he became also who is who. What about Esther in captivity? A slave girl taken away. But she became the, pre, the, the queen. And the Bible says it is for such a time as this. God providentially works behind the scene for something bigger than you have ever thought. Hallelujah. What about Joseph? Sibling rivalries with his brothers. And then he was sold away in slavery. He was in all kinds of things. And then his brothers came, oh please, our father is dead now. Please forgive us now because now you are going to revenge. He said, excuse me, you did not send me here. You meant it for bad, but God turned it for good because God wanted to be, me to come here before you so that we can save many people. Give the Lord a mighty hand clap. <laughs> See, I want to encourage you. The steps of a righteous person is ordered by the Lord. Did you know that? Everything works for good to them that love the Lord that are called according to his purpose. Did you know that? Very important for you to understand. The Bible says, give thanks in all things and for all circumstances because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The Bible says, keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Don't go by the newspapers and the media. Go back to the original blueprint. When you're going through stuff, don't jump out of the crucible. You are going to jump into the real fire. Allow the tampering work of God, the purification work of God, to come to its full cause. Why? He wants to make you a vessel that can be mightily and powerfully used according to his plan that he has ordained for you before the foundation of the world. Very important. Okay? God's ways are not our ways. In his time, God makes everything beautiful. You were born at a time like this, at the right time. 
the right purpose, the right place, the right parents. So do please don't disappoint God. You need the presence of God. Hallelujah. And lastly, before we go, his patience. God is patient. Hallelujah. No wonder patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. When you are mature, then you begin to bear fruit. But let me tell you, God is an amazing God. He is so precious because he's so patient. Very patient. Look at Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. His compassions never ends. It is only the Lord's mercies that have kept us from complete destruction. Great is his faithfulness. His loving kindness begins afresh each day. Wow. When I think about God's patience, yes, I know the Bible says God had to take away the children of Israel for 430 years in slavery. Why? He was preparing them to come and punish the Amorites. He says because the iniquities of the Amorites are not yet full. He was coming, but gave them 430 years to amend their ways. How about Jonah? We had it here. 120 years for people to repent and come back to their senses. But nobody except Noah and the animals. Okay? And then we have Jonah and the Syrians. Why do you think Jonah decided to flee and go to Spain, Tashis? We were told here it was over 2,000 kilometers away. And yet Nineveh was only 500. But at that instant, what happened? Noah, Jonah decided to go the opposite way. He even paid a very expensive fare. And when he was told, go back, he preferred suicide. You know? And then later on, God, by his grace, provided a submarine vessel that of a different nature. That transported him right to his missionary post. <laughs> Mission post. And when he arrived there, what did he do? It was not good news that he preached. It was bad news. 40 more days, the city will be finished. 40 more days, the city will be finished. Is that good news? It was not good news. And then later on, when the Syrians repented, he was so angry. He was mad. How can you get mad when people get saved? How? He said, kill me, God. Can you imagine? Why? Because God was so patient with the Syrians. They were very brutal people. They were so immoral. They were so merciless. They were godless. They were so barbaric savages. In fact, they were so they were worse than ISIS. Do you know, not only do they used to burn people and bury people alive, if you study their archaeology, they used to skin living people alive. Skinning, skinning people. Can you imagine? You are alive and they're skinning you without any anesthesia. They have not actually put you to sleep. That's why Joanna said, God, if it is to go there, look, I'm, I would rather die than go. But you know, God is an amazing God. You know what he did? However brutal these guys were, however godless these guys were, his grace, his patience prevailed. Jonah still preached a very bad sermon. But let me tell you something. There was no grace in it, but God showed grace. That is the patience of God. Can we give him a mighty hand clap in the house? And, and this is the problem that we have. We become so impatient with the people, but if we could just look back and see where God picked us from, we will be patient. Hallelujah. When we look at sinners doing all kinds of wicked things, we lose track that we were once there. But the grace of God, the patience of God, because in his time, he makes everything beautiful. When you look at people calling good evil, swearing and cursing God and spitting in God's face, you ask the question, why can't God just in one breath obliterate the whole universe and build a new one? After all, we are going to heaven. It is the patience of God. He is not willing that any should perish, but that everybody should repent and come to the saving knowledge of his son, Jesus. That is why Jesus is so precious. That's why we are told to pray for sinners, not to curse them. That's why we extend grace. In every circumstance, extend grace. Hallelujah. Can we bow our heads right now? Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Show us your love. Show us your grace. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
Yes, Lord, thank you for your prophecy. Thank you for the person of Jesus. Thank you, oh God, for the provision. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your providence. Thank you for your patience. Lord, you said so clearly in your word that in the last days, I will blow the trumpet again. Lord, it has taken over 2,000 years. You have been so patient, you could have come back any time. Lord, I pray this morning, giving opportunity for my brothers, to my brothers and sisters who are here, that Lord, you will do it again. You will invite people to the kingdom of God. Your love, your grace, your patience has been extended to us. And you have brought us here, O oh God Almighty, because of who you are. You are precious. We cannot do without you. So I shut every other voice and I pray against any opposing demon that would want people not to give their lives to the Lord. I resist and I command it to go. Lord, I pray for open heavens. I give you thanks. While all heads are bowed, nobody looking around, believers are praying. You are here. You did not come here by your own. Jesus brought you here because he wants to show you that the most precious person that you need in your life is him. He is precious. He is inestimable. He is of intrinsic value. You cannot trade him for anything. What you need